we're talking about, well, we're going to talk about whatever the hell we want to talk about, but technically <laughs> we're supposed to be talking about global markets yep. or America versus Asia, as I like to call it, um, and who's better. Um, let's start with David on the end and let's introduce ourselves to everybody and uh, what country we're from. What nationality we are. So my name is David Lee. I'm from America, born in LA. I don't sp I'm Korean American, don't speak a lick of Korean. Um, my, I'm managing partner of Refactor Capital. We've invested in some, pro I've invested personally in some Korean projects. My prior life and my prior fund, we invested in Coinbase block stack. We put that down, I put it down for a while. We're thinking as a firm about a re-entry into crypto. And if we do something in crypto at Refactor, we'll probably do it. I think Asia and other parts of the world, is uh, that's an important vector. Uh, yes, my name is Alex Shin. I am a founding partner at Hashed. Hashed is one of the largest crypto assets venture capital, project accelerator, um, community builder based out in Korea. I'm actually based here in San Francisco. Hi, everyone. I'm Shin Hae Lee, partner at GBIC. And we also own um, Accelerating Arm called Block72. So uh, we have uh, three offices or three regions. We are based in the United States, China, and Korea. I'm currently based in South Korea, but I used to study and live uh, here in Silicon Valley and also live in China. So I hope I can represent more than just Korea. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Lee. Uh, I'm the founding management partner of uh, HCM Capital. Uh, we, are back, we are a venture arm backed by Foxconn Technology Group. Uh, I've been, I'm a Taiwanese. Uh, however, I, I've been living in China. I live in Beijing for about over 10 years. And then I frequently travel here uh, for investment. Yeah, so we invest in China and US. Yeah, actually, it's a gold body. Yeah. All right, my name is Mike Arrington. I'm the founder, one, actually, I'm co-founder, one of the partners at Arrington XRP Capital. Um, we're an American hedge fund, although we don't invest in American companies anymore uh, for a variety of reasons, which we can get into or not up here. Um, but it's because of the SEC. Let's talk about, since, we, since I started with regulation, let's talk about regulation. Um, and the differing philosophies of, I'm saying Asia as a, as a group, but really it's very different across Asia. In the United States, and we can throw in Europe there for fun if we want to, although none of us are European. And I think I've done two European deals, but we can talk about it a little bit. Um, so let's just start off with, uh, Sinhe, let's start with you, since you're um, yeah. in Korea. You live in Korea, right? Right now, yes. You speak Chinese, you've educated partially in America, so right. you know every, okay, yeah. <laughs> So I think like the every government, not every government, but the purpose of the regulation for government is number one, they want to protect the retail investors. Uh, number two, they want to control the cash flow, especially outflow. Are, that, that are you talking about Korea right now? No, just in general. In general, okay. Right. And number three, they still don't want to miss the don't want to miss the train of the new technology development, such as blockchain. So Korea, I mean, there has been a lot of saying that Korea banned ICO, but the actual the actual case is Korea never uh, really banned ICO. The government dis encouraged the ICO, uh, but because the Korea has a positive law system, which means people can only, you're only allowed to do what's written in the regulation. So that's why a lot of companies, uh, especially Korean company, left Korea to build their foundation and register in uh, more uh, other Asian countries, which are more like favorable to ICO and then cryptocurrency in general, which is Singapore and Hong Kong, etc. But I really see really positive movement from the Korean government. So uh, they uh, are moving really fast to really set the regulations on blockchain, especially in cryptocurrencies and ICOs. And the highlight would be, hey, the ICO will be allowed but it has to be under control. So that means you have to go through certain registration um, process. You have to get, you have to get like go through KYC. And after ICO, you still have the liability to report what happened and how you use your money, for example. So a lot of really great initiatives are coming from the Korean government. And I'm really excited about that. Wasn't there, 
this is something that's been whispered to me but never in public. In Korea last year, when Korea was talking about banning ICOs or the rumor, wasn't there one guy in government and then yeah. he was literally murdered, right? <laughs> no, right? Didn't he? Wasn't he literally murdered and then after that everything eased up? No, so again, it was never officially announced, right? So Korea government never announced that it's, it's banned it. Again, because of the law system, it was discouraged, right? But then once the government uh, say, hey, we might ban ICO and the cryptocurrency trading and will ban exchanges, about 200 100,000 citizens wrote a petition to Seoul government say they cannot do that. And again, like the government, it's democracy, they need the votes from the citizens. So right now, the Korea is in a situation that they cannot just uh, ban cryptocurrency, which is so popular in Korea, right? You probably heard about kimchi premium. About 30% of the population has experience in cryptocurrency trading. And they think it's a dream for them uh, to really uh, gain the quick money. So again, the government uh, is looking to work okay. with the project. All right. Uh, any other thoughts here on Korea? Singapore, is it still, do you think, the best market in Asia? Uh, no. No, not really. So a lot of our projects are incorporating in Singapore. We're incorporating in Singapore. On the outside, the, it looks surprisingly friendly, but when you get there, it's not. Uh, so it, there's a lot of hoops to get through to really set up there. Um, I, I think when you're based in Asia, it's still the best alternative, right? Um, it just doesn't look very awesome when you show up with Malta or Bermuda as your you know, foundation. So people are going to Singapore, but the legal hoops are getting harder and making bank accounts are getting you know, much more difficult. A lot of the bank accounts are just being placed in Malaysia. And I think the only thing I would add is I was talking to one attorney um, who's in this area and she said that historically, like the U.S. still really matters and the, the reason why is because historically Japan usually follows the U.S. So if, you, if the U.S. takes a certain position with a technology or an issue, um, Japan will, that'll influence the Japanese authorities a lot and then Korea follows Japan. Yeah. And so but the problem is the U.S. won't actually take exactly. a position. Exactly. So that and doesn't that piss you off, Jack? Uh, I understand. Uh, I, I the U.S. will not engage in like any kind of regulation regulation here, other than you know enforcement actions against companies. Does that worry you? Does that make you hesitant to invest in the U.S.? Uh, uh, I think as I say, it's fully understandable. But no, it's not. I, I definitely. Uh, we, we believe, like what, what people now keep talking about, the uh, security token, that kind of thing, you know. I think, uh, I, I, as I know, U.S. government tried to find, I, I think about a year ago, they keep promoting that, what they call the SRO, self-regulatory organization, try to come up with the new good uh, suggestion on the, on the new regulation. However, I recently, more people talk about the uh, security token, that kind of thing, want to use those uh, existing security regulation to... Yeah, and then, yeah, I, I think if you want to invest in U.S., we, we, uh, we have to follow that, the rule here. Okay. But in other, many other countries, like uh, Japan or like uh, Singapore, I think Korea, uh, I think that's the, especially Japan and Singapore, I, I think they will come up with the really brand new regulation for the token. It's not used in the 80 or 90 years old, so, you know. And, and how about the other panelists? Do any hesitation investing in the U.S. like, like I do, or am I the only one that understands the risks here? Uh, I, I think the regulatory risk is real. Um, you know, about half of our portfolio are U.S. companies. And really? Yeah. And, See, and, Hashed is known as the dominant fund in Korea, sort of mm -hmm. the Samsung of crypto. And you guys consistently talk about how most of your investments are outside of Korea today. Right. Is that a, like, do you feel like this is like a constant message? Like you're so dominant in Korea that that overshadows the things you do I, outside. I think, exactly. I think the weird, you know, 64 or five investments, I think five are Korean at max. Three of them are like our best friends from college. So it's, 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 it's a lot of international projects looking uh, to us as a, a vantage point into Asia. Right? And it's not like we discovered them really early on because we weren't nearly as active a year ago this time. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really important message to get out there. But jumping back to your original point, uh, a handful of projects have in the U.S. have returned funds to us. Uh, many of them are, are stopping from releasing tokens just until they see a little bit more clarity. A lot of the projects that are arriving today, mind it, the founders are becoming better and better. So that's great news. But they're sort of raising in equity rounds and 
you know, we'll consider the possibility of issuing tokens a little bit later, right? So the stages are definitely slowing down. Uh, I think it's pretty clear. I mean, so going back to your question on his portfolio, to be honest, I think like blockchain is so global. It's like very hard to say, oh, it's like the US investment versus Korean investment. Sometimes even though the founders are from Korea, but they probably register in Singapore, they have tech team in Silicon Valley, but marketing team in China. So. I mean, it's just really, really, really global project and decentralized organization. But, but the thing with the U.S. projects is like most of them are Cayman entities or whatever you call it, right? But even then, it's, it's, it's such an authoritarian government here that they'll, they'll come chase you down. So the risk is real, I think. Okay. Any other thoughts on regulation? I mean no, what I try to say is that it's different than 20 years ago. Now we are living... In a, yeah, it is after Internet of Information era, right? Team and people can work in a very decentralized, across global way. So that's, I mean, that's why, like Alice say, yeah, that's a many project we're going to other. I, I, all right, let me ask something, and I, I want to phrase it right. But privately, I don't, I won't say you guys, but privately, people like you guys talk to me about in much sterner terms about regulatory issues than you are here in public. Is there, is there something culturally about not saying bad things about government in public that, that's a concern? I mean, I'm, I'm just like, because I, I, I have diff, much different conversations on state. I say exactly the same things. I say, fuck the SEC, and I say it up here, and I say it back there. But I hear, and I, I think, uh, I honestly think if we were all would say the same things on stage, we say backstage, not you guys, but people just like you guys that look just like you guys. I think we'd have a better conversation. Easy, easy. <laughs> I mean, the regulation technology, really like disruptive technology or new technology, regulation always has been following, uh, have been following the technology. For example, I know that Airbus um, developed their air taxi. So they are right now technically 90% ready, but they cannot run air taxi just because there is no regulation, there is no infrastructure. So, I mean, I think it's fair that we expect that they work hard to come up with the clear regulation because that's what we really, really need in this um, to okay. facilitate the de development of technology. But, I mean, they need to study and they need time to talk to us, like projects, like investors, and uh, other like key like stakeholders in okay. the ecosystem. All right. No, I mean, no, uh, to chime in on that idea, like I, I don't necessarily speak for all of Hashed. I'm the American partner on the team. It's, it's a little bizarre that we have 45% of the white collar population trading crypto and crypto is still not an asset class in Korea. Like no one is being taxed. Six months ago, we made miners can't trade crypto finally. AMLs and KYCs are finally required after most of the country has already signed up. So that's a little bizarre to me, right? Um, I think what's going on with the US and the SEC is unfortunate, but it's good for Asia. Right, I think it gives yeah. an opportunity for a lot of the Asian countries to steal some of the Silicon Valley thunder. But for example, in Korea, like the gain tax, a gain uh, capital gain from security is not taxable. For example, still, okay. I mean, it's just the government stance. David, no, I was going to say that it is um, because a lot of jurisdictions follow the U.S. And the fact, to your point, the U.S. there's almost a stasis or a standstill. Um, it kind of reminds, I mean, Alex said, I think a lot of teams outside of the U.S. are just moving a lot faster, um, because, either because there's more certainty or um, you don't have the yeah, uncertainty they're not afraid. Of, of... They're not afraid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which is amazing. Um, also, they try to catch it up, you know, like Japan, Canada, right? right? I think that's the opportunity okay. for, 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 for those countries. So I think we all started with different viewpoints, but I think we've all come around to a single viewpoint here. And I feel like we've come to agreement that the SEC, bad, right? And Asia, good. Leadership in Asia, good. And it'd be great if the SEC could pull its head into a good place from where it is now. Um, but I'll move on. Unless there's any final agreement. Oh, no, we're good. Next question. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's talk about... Let's talk about exchanges. Now, this is fun because in the US, we have exchanges where you don't have to pay off people to get your coin listed on the exchange. Actually, for the most part, they just have frozen new listings. In Asia, it seems like you have to pay off either an employee of the exchange or the exchange itself or both. And I'm just wondering, like, who's the best person to pay off at each individual exchange? Could you guys like, go into that? So. 
Okay, I'm kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding, but, but that's obviously proprietary information, but let's talk, what, is that going to change? Okay, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to, this is really important. This is genuinely important because, yeah. I, first of all, a, Asia is more than just consumer markets, everybody. It's not just trade volumes and pumps and to the moons. So let's set that tone really straight. The exchange wars are a little bit tricky, and, and it varies by region and some of the, the characteristics. In, like, let's take Korea, for example. The penetration, local penetration is so high, it's kind of like T-Mobile and AT&T, right? These, these exchanges want to steal users from other exchanges. So, so they're going to want ways to market to their users. Hey, we got this new coin coming up. We have this new promotion coming up. Do X number of trades or move, move it into this exchange or wallet, then, then there's a raffle that goes out. So it's, again, it's un unregulated for the most part. The exchanges are self-regulating, right? And I don't, to them, it's not a fee. Yeah. To them, it's a marketing budget. And, and I think it, that varies differently. I've heard some other things from other exchanges in other parts of Asia where there is a venture arm that's sort of involved with the listing, which gets really confusing here. Uh, but it's, they return the money to you after, it, you know, 2X is or something. And, and there isn't a listing fee. But, but then maybe, maybe that 2X is the listing fee. Who knows? Right? So there's really creative ways that they approach this, and it's changing every, every month. I mean, exchanges are an important part of the ecosystem uh, to allow users to acquire tokens and custody the assets. Um, a lot of big exchanges are coming from Asia. Um, I, I can name it. Um, I think number one, I think it's, there is a good trend uh, going on among exchanges. For example, Huobi uh, just announced that they are not gonna uh, ask projects 1, billion, uh, 1 million to 2 billion USD for a listing fee. And for example, other exchanges uh, are- that, that goes to the company or it goes to the individual like listing manager? They say they are not gonna, they are gonna accept they don't, will not require oh. projects to pay the leasing okay. fee. Okay, so it goes right, right to the marketing manager. <laughs> but look, but no, I, mean, I mean, but that's the thing, like there's, there's exchanges I know of that I can't name <laughs> that, that very publicly states that they don't have listing fees, but there's other fees, yeah. right? Well, it, fee? that, that it comes across like a fee to a project. Uh, which is kind of troublesome when you're here and you have U.S. auditors and they're like, don't even talk to the exchanges, right? I think things get really, really complicated. I mean, like the competition is getting really, really severe. So every exchanges are trying to find a way to acquire more users and increase the transaction volume, right? So for example, there is another new concept, which is transfigo mining exchanges came out from China. I think it's, to be honest, it's really, really destructive because it partially gives back to the... Um, users. So I think, again, I mean, we know the exchanges have acquired a lot of uh, revenue yeah. last year from users, from projects and everywhere. But I think there is a good trend going on among exchanges. So like they say, oh, okay, we are going to only do uh, voting from either uh, retail investors. So Bithum, is tr Bithum, which is number one Korean exchange, is trying to make another process uh, to list a project by going through the retail investors voting, which okay. Binance is right. doing, for example. Uh, okay, I, I have uh, some thought. Uh, I think what we talk about the exchange, especially those one, especially those one from Asia, from China, I think, uh, or Korea, I think that, yeah, yeah, they come up very fast because uh, suddenly, right, since last year, so many, several thousand tokens come up to the market and then, and then it, it, yeah, it's easy to, you know, you have a good IT, IT system, just like apply the trading system from FS or fixed income or whatever, right? I think it's, it's, it's already mature technology. And then second, only if you can do better serv customer service, for example, like uh, Binance, maybe. And then suddenly you make a lot of money. However, you, you got to really think back. What will be the future of uh, what we call the exchange or brokerage dealer or whatever? You know, I think in the future, it should be a really a good technology platform, whatever it's called. And also it should have uh, you know, the gateway for, yeah, of course, the, uh, compli fully compliance with the regulator and have a business license to operate. That's number one. And number two, you have a gateway to fiat, right? Fiat, not only crypto to crypto, you know? Yeah, you, you gotta be, yeah, and service. And number three, you, you know, because we, we know now, now there's so many exchanges, there's a lot of upcharge opportunity, right? Different exchanges has a very different price, right? In, so th this is a very, very fragment market. So I believe in the future, whatever we call exchange or the technology, whatever platform, right? Uh, should, can also link 
better for the different exchange or different brokerage dealer or different whatever, right? Well, to provide the most effective pricing discover system. Yeah, no, to I, eliminate I, the arbitrage. Yeah, and then, yeah, exchanges should be regulated, of course. And if they had that, the fees and everything would be much better. But there's always some rock in the middle of nowhere who wants that business in their country, in, in their jurisdiction. So they'll make really favorable terms to, to bring new exchanges like Malta, right? So that, that's, this is the challenge, I think, that's, that's plaguing the, the crypto industry today. A lot of exchanges um, are, are more, they're more mature now, so just better AMLs and KYC procedures. It's much better than it was like six months ago. I, I, don't, I don't think we're going to see as many real, uh, retail investors getting hurt like that. Binance has a division called You don't launch, think we'll see what? Uh, like Is retail investors just getting completely dumped on yep. and just getting, getting abused in that, in, in that matter because most exchanges now, especially when you get as big as Binance and Bitrix, they have teams that are dedicated to try and stop a lot of these fake volume and fake movements that are going on, but they're incredibly difficult to catch, right? I mean, I would hope that this is a place where the industry players sort of regulate themselves. I mean, one analogy is like the early search engines where you could pay for your listing to be ranked highly. And over time, people understood that, like, I think of exchanges almost like search engines. There are no network effects until there are really deep network effects. Like the switching costs are so low. And so I think an exchange that does that in the short term, they're, they're basically, there's no user trust, and over time, that just won't be durable. And so I feel like this is something where it's an opportunity for the industry to police itself, and the reality is I, I think this is just short-term behavior that eventually will go away. You know, David, you don't say a lot, but when you talk, it's really smart. You're just a very <laughs> handsome, smart, deep thinker. No, seriously. I always listen Thank when you, you talk. Yeah. I really like you. I mean, you've been fantastic for my business over the years as well. But, um, sorry, I just got flustered for a minute. Um, let's talk about, I'm going to say something that maybe you guys will disagree with, but I'm just, I just want to make a bold statement and then we can talk about it. Um, to me, it seems like um, Asian investors, again, as a gross oversimplification. We're mostly talking about Chinese investors when we talk about Asian investors. Move is a herd sometimes. They all kind of like, they roll one into one deal and then as soon as the market goes bad or when the market goes bad, none of them are investing. Sort of right now, everybody's sort of dead silent. And, it, and I'll make the case that American investors will be a little bit more contrarian at times and place bets that might seem a little crazy and, and move independent of each other. Now again, I'm an American. It sounds sort of ridiculous for me to say that and to lump everyone together, but I I do feel that that's kind of the case. Agree, yeah. disagree, and why? I mean, venture capital is, is it's a really early market in Asia, right? Very early market. And if you look at uh, the leading venture capital um, scene in China, they're, they're, they're crushing it, but they're also sitting on a growth market, right? So you run, on, you run into a, a typical crypto fund in Asia and you ask, what's your investment thesis? Like, I, I really doubt that they have a really strong, compelling answer. Whereas you come here, you have guys like, oh, we just do programmable money. Uh, we, we you know, invest directly around governance. You know, we like infrastructure. Everybody has typical ideas here. But over there, it's kind of definitely followed the herd. Including hashed. No. We're different. <laughs> we also don't have LPs. So it's, you know, we have a lot more flexibility and, and autonomy in sort of what we do. So, Michael, um, to answer your question, I will say yes, uh, especially in China. Uh, just because if you look at the Chinese blockchain or cryptocurrency market, it is super, super interconnected. So uh, means investors, miners, exchanges, projects, and media, they're like all interconnect interconnected, right? For example, like ex uh, like like head founder of node capital or used to like be the ceo of like hobby for example so it's like super super interconnected so i think like they are kind of moving like in the same direction uh in a sense and then the information is shared really really quickly among those inter uh parties and i think it's yes it's um it can be a bad thing because probably just either like we all invest in like one project or I don't invest for the rest of the year. But I think because it's so interconnected, I think actually a lot of development and innovations are coming up uh, from the China, from the China market. Jack? 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think because in China still, that's a very especially uh, all Asia. Many, I think it's a very retail-driven market. So suddenly, this uh, crypto mania come up. I think because of lack of uh, regulation, so many people uh, jump in. Then that's why Ch Chinese governments ban entirely the whole crypto market. Even now, ban the media. Jack, where are you based? Uh, Beijing. Okay. Yeah. So you have to be somewhat careful in what you say. Right? Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, you are right. So that's <laughs> maybe I have to move up. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it should be okay. It, since I'm not speaking in China, but I mean that's true. But however, Chinese government will come up with some anyway. For example, like uh, central government issue cryptocurrency for sure. I think will be one of the earliest country to in that, to uh, adopt this kind of a uh, new new uh, crypto uh, cryptocurrency. And also blockchain is welcome. However, do you have any special information about that? I, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's keep delaying. We, I heard about it will be rolled out like in October this month. Anyway, it's keep keep delaying. I think they are doing some testing. Yeah, it's already all the pro, all the program is already done. Yeah, yeah, really. I mean, yeah. I, I think they will, will roll out this, this this kind of central government issue cryptocurrency. Okay. Yeah, very soon. It's like a digital IMB with blockchain, something like that. Yeah, like the blockchain the kind of technology. I mean, I don't have as much exposure to how Asia, investors in Asia think, but I I disagree actually because I think the herd mentality is pretty strong in Silicon Valley and the U.S. If certain investors are in, then there's just a rush to try to get into those opportunities. And what Sinhei described kind of sounds like U.S. venture capital in like the 80s or 90s, you know, it's just, it's just a smaller network. So I think the instinct is the same. I think just the dynamic. It's human different. nature. It's human Excuse nature. Me? It's human nature. FOMO. It's human nature. I mean, you're, and yes, in Korea, maybe social proof is a little bit more important. If a founder went to a, a certain school or, or they came out of a certain company, but the dynamic is still the same of just it being human nature. Indeed, when in the future, in the, the future, uh, I mean, the, all the token economy, right? If uh, the good project can raise funds directly through the, uh, the token, right? Then maybe there's no need for venture capital. I'm, I'm not saying how about you. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, that, 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 but however, there will be a, a, a few steps, right? I mean, um, what do you think? Because you have exposure to U.S. and more exposure to the Asian investors than I have, or... I mean, you probably have the most exposure of both. So what do you think? I think weak investors always follow the herd. Strong investors follow the herd when it makes sense. Um, I certainly will sometimes be interested in a deal because of who's in a deal. But I've also made investments and that no one else has been in. I mean, I invested in Nexo in Europe, and I, I couldn't talk any, any of you guys into it. And, and I think we 5 x it. Um, like, Real fast. And it was a security token. It was an early security token. There was some weirdness about it. But, you know, uh, I think that might be my one success story. There might be three or four deals I was like, I know better than everyone else. And, you know, I did less well than four to five X. But um, I, I think that it's important for us not to all move as a herd. Otherwise, we're all one big fund. But there is a difference. China... You know, Sinhei was talking about, you know, there's like media and mining and investment and, 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 and market making, which we never talk about because we don't talk about it, and other stuff that um, happens. And um, it, it actually is so interconnected that if you get everyone together, they can make something that wouldn't have been successful, successful. And we're seeing this repeatedly because we have such early liquidity, we don't have to prove out a product or even build a product. We issue, we being the company, issue an ERC-20 token, the right Asian exchanges are connected to the right Asian funds and everything just pops and then the Asian funds sell everything and, and then we sell everything because we're like, oh shit. And then, um, and then, and then you know, other stuff happens, right? And, meaning, it, you know, and then sometimes it goes like this, but, um, in that case, it's sort of like the reality is, if everybody says it's going to be successful, it is sort of a fake success for a while. And that's different than the, the traditional ventures. So I haven't quite figured that piece out yet. Um, but I think as the press continues to shine a light on that, and they have been with certain Asian funds and certain Asian exchanges being deeply connected, um, that will become less 
possible, and maybe we'll see less of that bullshit. Because ultimately, that means the insiders, the funds, all of us, we do fine. But everybody that follows, you know, gets wrecked. And that's, that's not good. That's what the SEC in the U.S. needs to worry about as well. That's my opinion on that. But again, an insightful comment, David. <laughs> I've made a lot of, you, not everybody here knows this, but I've known David for a long time back at my TechCrunch days when he was at SV Angel, and I made uh, all but one of my master investments were largely because of David, Airbnb and Pinterest and some others. And uh, so I, David, I owe David a lot. Um, I tried to talk him into investing in Uber with me, and he, he didn't do it. Um, and that was like the one. But thanks for that. But you had a you have the, one of the best, if not the best, investing track records in in, in angel history. So um, I like to say good things about you. All right. Um, let's talk about the types of deals that are popular in Asia versus the types of deals that are popular in the U.S. right now. And again, there's a lot of of cross pollination. But again, I'll make a strong statement, and we can disagree. Asia is all about the reverse ICO and the apps right now. The US is all about the next generation, like not just a copycat of the next generation with the right buzzwords in the white paper, but like the actual like next generation is the US and Israel to some extent with Space Match, which is absolutely fantastic. What do you guys think? Oh, okay, maybe I can take a first shot. Uh, just like the internet, right? Uh, that, you know, in China, there's a, those uh, application market, uh, it's most successful, right? and technology is built here. So it's the same, it's just the, the continue this kind okay. of trend. So reverse ICO, those more market driven, those application driven, consumer okay. driven that, that will be more, more popular, I think will come faster. But indeed, that maybe can create the most use case for blockchain, right? And then, yeah, in US, I agree, it's a continue it's a building a better protocol, building, building a better infrastructure. So you agree with same. me? Yes. You think the best actual technology is being built in the United States now? Yes. Really? Yeah. I said that. I didn't even fully believe it. Uh, not, of course, it will be more diversified than, than, the, than the previous 20 years, 30 years. But still, I mean, because uh, still, I mean, U.S., right? That's why always the, the internet, those Google, Amazon, right? Facebook, all from here, right? I think that's still continue, right? I mean, okay. they have a good, good school, good education, good, good technology people. Yeah. Two on my side. Agree, disagree? It's a little tricky. I, I think, you know, the last five major innovations in tech, you know, sharing, social, mobile, all that good stuff kind of popped out in the bay. Just that harmony of capital and just sheer engineering power here, right? So a lot of that early foundational technology ideas will likely pop up here in New York, Berlin maybe, uh, because building a new internet protocol is not easy and the folks that can generally don't live in Korea or Singapore for that sakes. But the regions are very different. Korea is a very homogenous city. It's super wired. Everybody's using digital assets. 40% of the population in one city. The likelihood of maybe gaining moderate adoption is relatively higher than it is somewhat here, right? So the, the real tricky part is how do we sort of marriage the two ideas? And that's sort of where we spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, as a venture cross-borders kind of fund. The real tricky part now is a lot of the Bay Area projects, it's definitely a venture game. Whereas in Asia, it's still kind of utility token land, low caps, and they fight in the secondary markets. So we're seeing pre-product like projects, uh, open source projects, that's even different. In the Bay, that's at two, three, four hundred dollars, even three billion dollar valuations, right? What happens if you fork it and you localize and you iterate faster in Asia at a $10 million valuation, right? Where does the value generate actually happen? What's defensible? Probably not patents. Is it community or maybe just thought leadership on CK Snarks? Just five people in the world who could do it. But how defensible is that really for how long? So, right, so these are some of the questions we have to ask when we, when we invest and when we try to work with these projects and founders. Because I still think um, most of the projects in this, in, in this ecosystem is really overvalued. And they're sort of missing out on Asia because of that. I agree what Alex said. I think like technical like breakthrough will happen in the United States, but business side um, breakthrough will happen from Asia. So for example, um, Apple iPhone was um, birth here, but then if you know like how Chinese users are using mobile internet on their phone, right? It's China, Asia, or Asia like countries are so much more advanced, right? WeChat Pay, like you don't need to use cash in China, for example. They have WeChat Pay, which is really huge like penetration. 
like even like from tier one to all the way down to tier three, four cities in China. I mean, Facebook kind of copy uh, WeChat about like two years ago and trying to kind of include the pay function within the messenger. So again, like again, like like iOS, Apple came from the United States, but actual adoption and real use cases and like better use cases, better, better UX were, um, came from um, coming from uh, Asia. And I think it's gonna be the same thing in the blockchain. And to be, um, for, for, for me, I think Korea can show how uh, the blockchain can massively adopt it uh, very soon. To be honest, and you mentioned the reverse ICO. I particularly do not like the word reverse ICO, but reverse ICO is basically existing business which already has user bases and like business model um, adopt the blockchain technology. And considering how many people have experience uh, in uh, trading in cryptocurrency, and the average knowledge of the blockchain is really high in Korea. Plus, like those uh, existing business with existing users adopting blockchain, uh, and the beauty here is users should not know that this technology or this uh, app should be based on blockchain. It's so smooth that they just do what they used to do, but it's actually based on the blockchain. So combining these three factors, I think like Korea and most likely a lot of Asian countries will show how blockchain can be massively adopted. Yeah, <clears throat> I've never thought of it in terms of like reverse ICO, but I agree 100%. That's why we're spending all of our time, I mean, a lot of our time in Korea, because um, you think of a company like, uh, like Carrie. So I'm a personal investor, and they're leveraging this, um, the user base of Spoka. So it's this almost the, like- This uh, is the Netflix of Korea, right? No, it's the- Oh, that's content protocol. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's yeah. like the, the Square of, it's imagine if Square or, a digital registry launched a token and some of the things you could do with that. For a lot of reasons, I think it'd be really hard to do that in the US and one of the reasons is because consumers wouldn't want it or they wouldn't use it. Whereas I think in Korea, they're much more forward thinking, like the early majority, not the early adopters, but they wanna use tech and then they wanna use it with a partner or somebody that they trust. And so I think that's why um, them or, or Terra, which is a stable coin, I'm also an investor there. They have, it was started by an internet entrepreneur and he has an existing user base. And so I think that it's interesting because it's very complementary to the US. The US is more like, hey, we're just gonna build great technology and then we're gonna sort of put a layer of our user acquisition, best practices of user acquisition and think about that after we've built the tech. Yeah, I completely agree with Dave. Um, you guys are just saying you completely yeah. agree. <laughs> I mean, just say something. What did he say that you disagree with? Okay, I'll, I'll chime in. So I'm in the middle. Oh, I didn't mean I, to cut you off. So I, we, we, we led all three of those deals that you guys mentioned. So it's, it's an experiment though, right? There's all these questions about utility tokens. Is that going to work? Price stability is a huge problem. Like if I had $5 worth of points and it's $6 tomorrow and then four the next day and for coffee, am I gonna buy coffee or am I gonna speculate? I'm probably gonna speculate. So we're not quite sure. But if we sneak it into users, does it work? If we have massive scale, does it work? If we open 50 million wallets through the biggest messaging app in Korea, maybe people will try it in, in different ways and ecosystems will latch on and try to capture some of that adoption. Who knows? Just bear in mind that in a lot of ways, um, decentralization or censorship resistance, these types of things aren't nearly as important to other parts of the world. Uh, they just want to see utility. They want to win points. They already have points. They want that to be worth money, right? So there's, there's different triggers. There's different levers that we can pull to try and squeeze user base out of this. So for us, I think it's an interesting experiment that's really unique to our region. And we're going to make a bunch of bets to see how those play out. I would say that 10 years ago, the best and brightest Asian entrepreneurs, most of them, or at least a large percentage of them, would come to the US and start their companies. Clearly that number has significantly fallen and they are now going to Singapore or they're staying in Korea or they're staying in Japan or they're going to Japan, et cetera. You guys agree with this? Any disagreement on this? Uh, yeah, agree. Now, is this more regulation-based or tax-based, or is it just that the infrastructure in Asia has finally gotten to the point? What is there any? Sin hey, you seem to want to say something. Yeah. You know, I mean, I will give one example. One of my good friends is um, partner at Sequoia Capital, based in the United States. Uh, she's originally from China. 
she once told me that she regret uh, that she didn't go back to China a few years ago. Because if you look at the how technology, I'm not even talking about the blockchain. I'm talking about the um, the consumer mobile tech. How China has been um, aggressively um, growing that industry is just tremendous. So I think it's the same thing happened. Like again, in in Asia there is money, there is exchange, which you can get the liquidity. There is a cheaper labor. You can build, you can recruit uh, engineers, marketer probably like with one third or to one fifth of the. Uh, labor cost. I mean, everything is cheaper. They are really, really eager to work. And there's, there's clearly more economic freedom yes. than there is in the mm -hmm. U.S., yeah. if not personal freedom. Well, it's like China announces a ban again, and everything seems to grow even faster, right? So that, that, that shows you what's really going on. Because China is loud out there, but he, they do not have time and resources to track down every single one. And China is, when we talk about the regulation, we forgot to mention China, but China is very clear. They really support um, like uh, the blockchain development. They put millions of dollars on the researches, and they actually just opened Hainan Island as like the special pilot blockchain area that where a lot of big companies can go. For example, Huobi is in Hainan right now. Um, but again, they need to protect their retail investor and they worry about the capital outflow. That's why they're really loud and uh, okay. out there. I, I think there are two things. I mean, the first is like, if you think of Silicon Valley, it's called Silicon Valley because Shockley, you know, his mom was sick. He comes to Silicon Valley, traders say Intel starts and everything is formed around this geographically dense area. Um, and so Intel, Microsoft, Google, et cetera. And if you think about crypto, it's like Satoshi, we don't know, who that, and Vitalik, who from what I hear is basically a nomad. And I think that influences just the development of, so it's decentralized not just in tech, but also in the communities. And so um, if you're in Asia, or you're in China, or Argentina, or Berlin, it's like, why would you need to come to the US? And so the second thing, and you were there, is that at their blockchain week, the, the attitude of the Asian entrepreneur towards America is like strikingly different than, you know, early 2000s. Where in the early 2000s, it's like, oh, but it's always, you know, Baidu, Google of China, Alibaba, Amazon of China. Whereas, you know, when I went this past summer, it's just, oh yeah, America is a nice to have. Market's big enough here. And that to me was just anecdotally, it was just striking. Great comments, David. Um, Jack, any Yeah, I agree. I think now there's about, how much? China has a 1.4 billion population, and uh, the economy is, is still growing. So it's a very, it's a good timing. Yeah, like what also, also, uh, you guys say, it's a, it's a very good timing. Also, people work hard, and, then it's a, and, and also has already learned, right? Many people went back to China and uh, with being a good, 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 good knowledge, good technology here. So I think definitely, I, I think there will be more and more project, innovative project, not just the copy uh, come from China and yeah. other Asia countries. Good. Listen, I want to thank my panelists, especially David Lee on the end. David, uh, I appreciate, no, I'm kidding, but I appreciate your time and, uh, and also just for having me be part of this. It's, uh, it's great to talk to you all. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.